welcome to Indus Special. I'm Michelle Malik. A place struck by terror and grief after multiple bombings claimed the lives of more than 250 people on Easter. Sri Lanka is still struggling to keep peace. The situation has become increasingly precarious for, for the Muslim community, as many have come under attack after the bombings. Hundreds of Muslim refugees were also forced out of their homes as tensions can keep rising. Let's find out more about the story on tonight's show. Joining us for this discussion is Mr. Sheikh Intab Zafar, who is the representative of the Islamic Sufi community, joining us from Colombo. We're also joined by Dr. Kavinda Hishan, who is a, par a parliamentarian, joining us from Colombo. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Mr. Sheikh Intab, let's begin with you. Tell us the state of the Muslim community at this point in time, after all this communal violence has erupted. <laughs> Okay, so this particular incident takes place on Sunday and um, we never expected something at this magnitude to come when we have never heard the sounds of bombs being blasted in Sri Lanka in this lovely small island for the last nine years. So suddenly we get to hear that there have been one after another, one after another explosions which, uh, which was happening. And then a small rumor was spread that this has been done by Islamic militants, which is the ISIS group who has been involved with this, which actually struck the entire Islamic community by hold. Uh, whereas uh, we know that the ISIS does not represent Muslims, but what is going to happen in the next few days is going to be very challenging that uh, a lot of Islamophobia, global Islamophobia issues can creep into this beautiful island where the Muslims, will, the, the names of the peace-loving Muslims will be tarnished uh, in, in, in regard to what the ISIS uh, people have done. Yeah, and uh, uh, Mr. Intikhab, you say that, of course, all Muslims accept the fact that ISIS is not a representation of them, and yet they fear after attack like this takes place. Tell us the conditions of the Muslims prior to this attack. Were they well integrated into the community? How does uh, this attack just bring in so much uh, 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 such opposition towards them, so much hatred towards them all of a sudden? See, at the, at the end of the day, we uh, position ourselves as a minority which has an enormous amount of rights where many other minorities do not give. We have been living in harmony for more than thousands of year, years in Sri Lanka as a Muslim community. And we have unbelievable human rights given to us by the uh, Sri Lankan government in this beautiful country. So when a little bit of these things happen, we also expect to see certain backlashes which can erupt after this. Most people who use social media take it out of hand. Most people who might manipulate media can take it out of hand. So the Muslim community uh, is quite fierce, uh, stands a fear with regarding to this. And we have taken a lot of steps to bring back harmony, create a lot of interfaith uh, forums to make sure that the conditions are transparent between the larger peace-loving Muslim communities and others who are in this country. Yeah, and uh, would I ask Dr. Kavinda Hishan here, what are the role, uh, roles being played by uh, government officials and other authorities in order to prevent communal violence from breaking out to even a greater extent? What is being done to counter that? Uh, first of all, I think the, the Sri Lankan uh, people have gone through uh, 30 years of war. And in 19, 1983 riots, 1987 riots, we have learned um, when we fought with the Tamilians and the LTT that uh, it did not take Sri Lanka forward. So I think after the Sunday attack, the Sri Lankan community, especially the Muslim community, Catholic Christian community, even the Buddhist uh, majority have been uh, very patient. And um, we have been living in harmony with the Muslim community and all the other communities for very long time. And this is a very sad situation. Um, as the government, Honorable Prime Minister immediately took actions to ban social media and gave instructions to the of, uh, security forces to um, arrest all the criminals who are who have been involved in this um, uh, terrorist act activities and terrorist attack so we have been capable to um, arrest most of them 
and some of them have died um so i think as as the government we have taken the initiative and all the measures yeah. to safeguard guard the people of sri lanka especially the minorities and uh, and and these people who uh, attack the christian churches and the catholic churches expected a black a backlash but i think um, his eminence cardinal malcolm ranjit uh, did a great job by standing up for all the religion uh, and then uh, the, all the communities and uh, he requested the people of sri lanka to uh, act and behave in peace dr. so i think uh, that yeah. have been very much right and dr kavinda at the attack a burka ban was also a placed do you think that that sent out a wrong message to the community that somehow muslims were being targeted after the attack i i uh, uh, i don't think so because we have had lot of uh, discussions with the muslim community especially muslim religious leaders and uh, they said that you know they came up with this idea that we should uh, to overcome this fear that the people has that we might have to you know not to cover the faces of uh, women because there were incident where men were dressed uh, with the burqa and covering themselves so some of them were uh, they some of the people in sri lanka had the fear that these people might um, again uh, attack another place of worship uh, or might do something uh, to terrorize the people so this was a request by the uh, majority of the people here and the muslim community was very positive here in sri lanka they have been very helpful to overcome this uh, terrorist attack and the uh, the people who have been involved in this terrorist uh, activities actually to be honest the people yeah. here in sri lanka the right. muslim community and uh, the the christian community are working together so this is a example to the world and we strongly believe the muslim community got nothing to do with this this is purely a terrorist attack yeah. so the right. people who have been involved are terrorists right. got and nothing nothing to do with the Muslim religion or the people who believe in Muslim religion. Dr. Kavinda that uh, there are reports also coming out that uh, Sri Lanka has sent back 200 Muslim clerics. Now with everything that you're saying that the community in Sri Lanka accepts the facts that Muslims are not to blame with this. What is happening when uh, so many clerics are sent back? What message is that sending? So we out? have we have 1600 refugees from Pakistan, Afghanistan, and uh, some other part of the world who have come uh, for refugee as refugees to sri lanka and uh, as asylum seekers so uh, unhcr is working with them and unhcr is responsible for them the government got nothing to do with this the government only provide the uh, facilities to them but the unhcr take care of them and most of them i think almost 200 them have left the country so their cases have been closed and the rest are here in sri lanka they are secure there is no attack on them so uh, there are there are around 40 of them who cannot claim uh, political asylums or um, refugee status so we are working what we should uh, do with them or what we can do with them yeah Uh, and Mr. Sheikh, and going back to you, uh, we've he heard what Dr. Kavinda has been talking about the state of Sri Lanka at the present moment. Can you tell us more about the Muslim community there? What is what are their sentiments like at this point in time? Uh, and since we're hearing a lot about attacks coming on shops uh, owned by Muslims and uh, being kicked out of their homes, how widespread is this issue exactly? uh most of the uh, black backlashes which happen through social media has been uh, derived by research that it is lot of millennials who are involved with this these millennials are mostly on social media and they can take social media by storm this is why the government almost banned this twice in this incident and once in a previous incident which happened about 7 to 8 months ago in so, an area so called so behind Tigana. most of so, the attacks are millennials who use social media yes basically they get influenced more you never see someone who is at the age of 60 or 70 years 
who will actually instigate anything or who has the capabilities of instigating anything. But the millennials uh, have got, you know, much more better organized ways of doing it. All of them are in, in WhatsApp groups. All of them are in broadcast group. All of them have multiple Facebook accounts, including fake accounts. So manipulating this is uh, not a hard task for them. So as a, real, as a result, as we expected, a few incidents have been recorded uh, in areas like Nikambo and um, elsewhere, where certain aftermath uh, issues have been happening and the government had also imposed curfew to make sure that everything is under control. So the Muslim community is actually um, standing all strong to stop all the extremism which has been done in the names names of uh, you know Muslims. And we have uh, we have made a pledge that we are going to work very hard more than ever with all the communities, and we are making this Ramazan to take it as a very low profile month so that we can bridge in all gaps together to fight our enemy who are the terrorists. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Shah, before we move on to interfaith harmony and how uh, the religious leaders are working towards that, tell us a little more about the fact uh, that content is circulating online, which is triggering attacks. What kind of content is circulating? Uh, have you heard of anything? Have you seen anything? Has anything been sent to you? With regarding to these contents, actually, um, the intelligence is doing thorough research to aware to make us aware about uh, what is going on or what possibly can happen. Meanwhile, there were some unofficial documents, uh, you know, distributed on social media, which we do not know how true it is. But as of now, the final confirmed news, which came two days ago, is that we are very confident to say that the government and the Department of uh, Army, Police, Intelligence have thoroughly given us a guarantee saying that everyone and anyone who has been directly involved with this attack are either in custody or either they are dead. So things can get back to normal ASAP as soon as possible. And we have the confidence and the, uh, the green light to say that things seem to be little by little uh, getting back in order. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Nanda, with this uh, uh, news of arrests or the fact that those who were responsible behind the Easter bombings being in custody, do you think the, that Sri Lanka will now experience a semblance of peace, peace will return back to Sri Lanka? <clears throat> I think, uh, think uh, as a country, we have to work towards it. We have to leave politics aside and all religion um, leaders must get together, work together. And I, I don't think that we have had um, this kind of experience before because the Muslims here in Sri Lanka, Christians here in Sri Lanka, as minorities, we have uh, lived very peacefully. So this is an incident that uh, <clears throat> what has happened due to a terrorist attack. So uh, we have to have the understanding of that and we have to um, take this understanding to the people of this country, to the gra grassroots level. So I think the religious leaders are doing that. And um, I have personally, I've written to His Excellency, the president and to the opposition leader, even to the prime minister, speaker and all the other political leaders, leave politics aside at this time, uh, get together with the nation and um, work together to overcome this issue because we do not want a civil war again here in Sri Lanka. And uh, what you said before here in Sri Lanka, what happened two days ago, last Saturday night, uh, it's very unfortunate that it was an accident. Um, two uh, youth fought and happened to be one Christian and one Muslim and then ended up a bit of a uncontrollable riot. But then the government was able to, within cup, within two, three hours, we were so able to no control group, the entire uh, riot. There were no groups involved in here. There were uh, because the reports that are coming are stating that Muslim shops were being burned down, uh, Muslim shop owners were being attacked. So you're talking about an isolated incident here. There were no uh, groups involved in this communal violence. This issue happened in in Nigambo, the electorate that I represent, and uh, the, in this uh, electorate, in this area, there were few incidents. But no one was uh, affected in the sense no one was hospitalized. There were no casualties. Uh, some of the shops were uh, broken in, but nothing was burnt as such. But we were able to control it. Right next day, His Eminence Cardinal Malcolm Ranjit went and met the Muslim community there. 
and uh, we were able to control the entire matter so uh, the if you go back to the history of in sri lanka we yep. have had these kind of black uh, backlashes uh, uh, in a, in a different level but here in right now things are much more controlled and uh, there is right. nothing happening and- uh, against any any religion uh, community in Sri Lanka right now. Right. And Dr. Kavinda mentioned here specifically that uh, you have uh, written letters uh, for the fact that people need to unite at this moment in time and that efforts need to be made at a grassroots level. What is being done uh, for those efforts to be made at the ground level for people to be brought together? Yeah, actually now we have spoken to uh, the Catholic community, Catholic priest and the uh, uh, Muslim priest and we have formed commi- uh, committees among these uh, religion leaders and the society so they can be uh, communicated and they can be educated at the same time we have to work towards the reconciliation uh, involving the government sector uh, officials so we are working on that yeah and mr sheik and takab what is the role community le- uh, leaders faith leaders are playing in uh, in promoting interfaith harmony at this point in time at this moment we've made this uh, the, the the most prioritized thing we've opened up our, our mosques for everyone we've made sure all the lectures which are done can be translated into other languages we've made sure that you know uh, religious uh, religious Uh, teachings are going to be aligned a lot in line of interfaith and we are we are also educating the crowd to set, to to uh, distribute the, the the harmony of this month the the blessings of this month in working a lot with uh, interfaith area so whenever you are breaking fast you know make sure that you give food to even your non muslim friends you know invite them to your house and many things so that we can bridge this gap as fast as possible Yeah, and do you feel like uh, there is an optimistic future there in bridging that gap? Uh, there is a lot of optimistic views as well. Uh, it goes it goes hand in hand because this is not the first time this has happened, and and uh, we have been a multi ethnic uh, a multi ethnic country for a very long time, and uh, so far I think everything is going quite positively, apart from uh, a few incidents which sometimes we see that you know social media has to be. uh i mean uh, th- there should be a better control on social media as to who is running what and things like that apart from that um we we presume that things will get back to normal for all of us uh, in this beautiful country yeah and uh, dr kavista last question to you uh, mr sheikh intikab also mentioned the social media ban here do you think that was the right move and do you think it paid off most certainly because um the social social media there are elements who want to ag- uh, aggravate this uh, situation here in sri lanka so um, i think the government took the first initiative banning uh, facebook social media i think it was a good move and uh, if there is a necessity uh, we might do it again yeah and mr shaken with social media and the fact that you mentioned a millennial specifically what is being done by the community at large to uh, create a positive atmosphere for the youth in order to educate them in order to tell them uh, about harmony and in order to make sure that there aren't an, uh, any riots or attacks breaking out specifically in regards to the youth yes yeah, see uh, what what we are going to position and change drastically in th- in this is that we understand that there is a large amount of an intellectual gap here this is trying to be an intellectual war so it is part of an intellectual gap where there is intellectual uh, uh, sources which need to be filled here we need to educate everyone in all streams who actually have uh, been probably too emotionalized with what they see in the media what they hear what they watch what they feel so as long as every community can bridge in this intellectual gap bring in people who can you know convince their through their words convince through their actions convince through beautiful words and uh, approaches to change their hearts positively i think that which has not happened largely before is now going to happen and i think we'll have to continue as well because so far it's, it's only one group of uh, people who are trying to actually speak here but it's now high time medical doctors professionals lawyers engineers lecturers and academics 
come from and share their intellectual exposures to make sure that this is uh, you know protected yeah and dr kavinda as mr sheikh intikhab mentioned here that there needs to be an effort made on the intellectual front in bridging that gap what do you think uh, can be done with this a uh, global phenomena of Islam Islamophobia spreading wide what do you think needs to be uh, hap uh, what do you think needs to be done in this region and in your country specifically certainly i agree agree with uh, sheikh and at the same time i think um, as a country we can't fight this alone um, we have to um, work uh, hand in hand with the international community and i think we have a good relationship with the asian countries and most of the uh, foreign uh, intelligence are working with us and um, i think i think we have to overcome the whole world has to overcome this uh, fear of terror so i think um, now we are in the verge of doing that with working hand in hand with the rest of the world because as a as a country we were not aware uh, the threat of this and even though the intelligence uh, have informed us and given certain reports but I think now Sri Lanka is moving forward, working with the uh, rest of the world. Yeah, and that's uh, for that point there, Dr. Kavinda Hishanan. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you, Mr. Sheikh Intikhab Zafar, for talking to us. We're going to take a short break. Stay with us. Welcome to India Special. While we talk about collective blame and how an entire community of individuals are blamed for the actions of a select few, joining us for this conversation is Mr. Adam Gary, who is the director at Eurasia Future Think Tank and also the co-host of the History Boys, along with George Galloway. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Adam. So, Mr. Adam, while we're having this discussion, we're seeing a rise of Islamophobia in the UK after the Christchurch attacks. It was almost a 500% increase in the attacks against Muslims. What do you think is fueling this? Well, throughout the world, hatred of a particular group for no rational reason can only arise because a state force or a well-funded, well-promoted pseudo-intellectual movement is in existence. And throughout the wider world, but particularly in the West, Israel and its apparatus, its human uh, shields, intellectually speaking, and its lobbyists throughout the world have created a narrative that states that Muslims are uniquely responsible for literally all, is what they say, all the world's evil, and that everyone else is uniquely the victim. This inflammatory rhetoric has been pushed and pushed by very sophisticated media circles. Now it's being used in social media, and it's what's being used to justify the colonization of Arab land. In South Asia, you see a similar narrative whose origins actually long predate Israel, and this is a Hindutva narrative which uniquely pins the blame on Muslims while advancing a Hindu supremacist uh, narrative <laughs> that uh, essentially wants to do the same thing in South Asia that Israel, in a wider sense, wants to do in the Middle East through something called the Yinon Plan for Zionist expansionism. So when you look at how countries and those whose ideologies help to propel narratives that exist uh, with in various race regimes, we can see how this then trickles down from very sophisticated, essentially brainwashing and mass manipulation techniques to ordinary people who actually think that they've reached their own conclusions when it's others who have decided for them. All right, so Mr. Adam, what you've alluded towards here is that there are many sophisticated uh, mechanisms at play which are building this narrative and then they're disseminating it. But also when you're talking about this and you're saying that people assume that they've reached their own conclusions when in fact they have been brainwashed, doesn't that uh, assume the fact that people are passive and they are not thinking for themselves? 
Well, people think that they're thinking for themselves, but they're not. And the reason for this is that there's a monopolization on the media in the Western world. Of course, people have access to the Internet and they can find out the truth if they want. They can watch your channel. They can watch multiple channels uh, from Muslim majority countries and see that the real world works in a very different way than that which the propagandists advance. But when you look at the corporate media in the Western world and when you look at the main Mainstream media in the Western world, they'll never portray uh, a Muslim person doing something productive. They'll never show success stories from the Islamic world. They'll never show economic and technical sophistication in the Islamic world. They will only ever portray Islam as a religion in a negative light and Muslims as human beings in a negative light. And that's the root of the problem. People don't just get brainwashed of their own accord. It has to happen through very powerful media channels and you have all of these media outlets, the most well-funded on the planet, that are all lined up against Muslims, you start to get real problems in society. Yeah, and with that point, uh, something that I feel like relates to it well is a tweet from Rupert Mur Murdoch, which stated, maybe mo most Muslims are peaceful, but until they recognize and destroy their growing jihadist cancer, they must be held responsible. Now, this is a media mogul, and something that you've stated here resonates well with what I've just uh, uh, put out here. What do you think happens when media moguls like this have such evident and blatant hatred towards one certain group and how that trickles down into those uh, those organizations they own well it's the influence influence is self-evident and when it comes to issues like this, not only are people in the West being told a falsehood, but they're being told a complete falsehood. Throughout much of the world, it is the Muslims who are being uniquely victimized, not just in Palestine and Kashmir and Myanmar, but in other places too. Uh, Muslims are uniquely victimized by the United States, and they have been for decades, war after war, upon Muslim-majority countries. And so if there was ever a narrative for someone to advance in the media, one should ask, why are Muslims being uniquely victimized? And this goes back to these early state ideologies, whether it's Zionism and whether it's Hindutva and whether it's the subservient media in the West that churn out these narratives that are overwhelmingly pro-Israel and buy into this narrative necessarily without ever questioning it. These people are doing a disservice to freedom of thought. They're doing a disservice to true information. And I think that the only cure is that uh, media outlets from the Muslim world should more actively promote themselves online in order to attract Western audiences who want to know the truth and who don't buy into the big lie. And from there, hopefully the power of free thought and the power of education can reverse these negative trends, which I said are a result of collective media brainwashing. Yeah. And Mr. Adam, we've talked about how the media is responsible for this, but uh, what do you think will if this trend continues in the future, something that we're seeing happening? But how do you think that's going to impact the fabric of the society at large? Well, it certainly can't make it better, and it may well make it worse. There is... It seems like it's a very grim situation, and in some ways it is, but there is some level of optimism. The more I talk to ordinary people face to face, whether it's in the street, whether it's in a cafe, whether it's at a meeting, I find that fewer and fewer of them are believing the big lies from the mainstream media, and fewer and fewer of them see this, um, this mechanistic view of the world put forward in the Western world by Israeli um, media apparatus, that it's somehow uh, Muslims versus everyone else reality. People are rejecting that. People understand that Muslims have been victimized. People understand that in multicultural countries in Europe, Muslims are the neighbors of everyone else, and that people live functionally and happy. So I think the combination of real-world experiences that reject this false propaganda... And, and Mr. Adam, what do you think is pushing for that realization, that rejection of these stereotypical images that the media has been portraying for so long? What is bringing about that change? I think it's the Internet. People like to focus on how the Internet is bad because negative stories 
tend to sell more and tend to get more attention than positive stories. But that itself is a dangerous trend because there are a lot of positive stories out there. When people see uh, foreign jets bombing Muslim countries, when they see the most wealthy and well-funded military in the world slaughtering civilians, and when people then meet people in their own communities that have had experiences abroad or that come from another culture, people realize that what they're, they're being told on the television and and what they're being told on the corporate websites is a big lie. And I think that the Internet, therefore, is incredibly powerful. Uh, Julian Assange and the war crimes that he revealed to the world, he could not have done that without the Internet. He would have been stopped. But when people can publish their own thoughts and share their own views, and when non-traditional, non-Western media outlets can get their point across, I think that it becomes very helpful for people because they can see the truth. And the minute one sees the truth, a false narrative automatically becomes shaky. Yeah. And on that point, thank you so much, Mr. Adam Gary, for joining us and talking to us. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Now we're joined by Dr. Hijra Saputra, who is the former president of Hull University Islamic Society, joining us from London. We're also joined by Mr. Mehmood Fez, who is a human rights activist, also joining us from London. Thank you both for joining us. Dr. Uh, Hijra Saputra, let me begin with you. How do you think harmful narratives are created in society to justify the marginalization of one society or one community? Well, um, I, be I believe that it, it will be not fair if um, because of one person's probably um, doing something bad and then uh, the entire community or probably particular religion will be blamed on this and then it will happen because um, normally people in normal they um, they see the news uh, probably would have um, um, would have which have a potential uh, wrong news probably in the perspective of news or um, I would like to say probably news propaganda so yeah. they have a wrong inform information so they uh, it it can uh, happen like this so and the entire right. will be blamed. Right. And Dr. Saputra, do you think that there is increasing hostilities towards certain communities, especially in European countries? Um, yes, of course. Of course, it when something happened, uh, for example, uh, the incident in Sri Lanka, um, our deep condolence to the uh, whole family there, and then we against the terrorism. Um, the potential will become higher for, uh, let's say, Muslim here because uh, living in UK is not uh, that easy now because uh, we have like a potential, um, you know, or let's say racism, um, terrorism as well. For example, here in our community, the police they. Um, uh, make uh, the standard of the security become higher. For example, most now they use the um, uh, the key lock for for the entrance and then uh, etc. So it's just to protect uh, Muslim as well. And then, uh, for example, um, some of family they have um, racist experience on the street. And then when something happen. Uh, let's say there is a uh, bombing in another country or other part of uh, the world so uh, the potential become higher for us here and then uh, normally the racist and hatred happen but when incident happen it become higher so yeah. uh, but alhamdulillah muslim here um, uh, they understand uh, how to you know um, to react on this and then but, but, but with that, uh, Dr. Saputra, if most have learned how to deal with the situation, that doesn't justify the situation from happening. And with that, I want to ask Mr. Mahmoud Fez here, why do you think uh, this happens, and specifically to the Muslim community, after a certain attack, everyone has to face collective blame for it? You make a very point. Why do why do people do that? Uh, I think sometimes they, it's, it's their narrow mindedness, it's their lack of understanding. I mean, a lot of these racist groups call themselves supreme. I've come across these groups. A lot of them can't even read and write or spell. How does that make you supreme? How does hating your fellow man or woman, sister or brother, make you supreme? It doesn't. These people are insecure people who have lack of, uh, in the majority of the case, have lack of job opportunities, have not educated them very well. And for their own failures, they want to blame someone else. 
Uh, and quite often, you know, you make a regard, I mean, I'm wearing a pinstripe shirt and I'm bald-headed. Now, if a person goes into a bank and robs a bank who's bald-headed, pinstripe shirt, you don't blame everybody with a pinstripe shirt and bald hat, do you? But that's what these people are doing because they have no, they have to have somewhere to channel their anger. And, be, and a lot of the time, the politicians dog whistle to racism. Yeah. And that's the problem we have, not in the United Kingdom, but across the globe, you know, you know, in all the countries. And politicians must be held responsible for these racist attacks that take place against Muslims or, for that matter, any other race. Yeah, and do you think ever since a uh, wing uh, politician started to gain a greater hold in these parts of the world, the emotions have intensified, even though we've seen these building up against Muslims after 9-11, but now they have started to intensify even further? Well, you know, I mean, it's 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 flavor of the day, isn't it? I mean, there wasn't very in in the seventies. It was it, I remember watching uh, in the English media. It was the Chinese that were the bogeyman. They were the horrible people. They were the bad people. They were the people that going to come destroy. And somehow the West have to have someone to blame and take their anger out to for all their own failings. Uh, and at the moment, it seems to be Muslims. Uh, in our member of the United Kingdom, in in the in the in the nineteen seventies, there was great deal of racism against Asian and black people, and it was against Muslims. That has now changed in the nineteen nineties and year two thousand. We now have racism against Muslims and East Europeans. So yeah. you know, it's it's again I say people have their own failures. Instead of looking at their failures, making themselves better, help improve themselves, they take the shortcut and improve and simply right. blame another right. person. And uh, Mr. Mahmood, to that thought, I want to ask uh, Dr. Saputra here, what happens when one community is uh, treated like a monolith, like everyone is the same in that community? Do you think that becomes easier for people to then dehumanize them collectively and then put blame on them when something goes wrong? Yes, of course. Of course, it's very hard and difficult for us, um, you know, especially living in this uh, city and then in this uh, country, because um, every single Muslim, one incident happens and and then they are so scared and then uh, they stop going outside and then they, you know, the life becomes scared because it's about the life as well. If you remember, um, there is in, there was incidents so when the Muslim uh, throw with the acid, and then um, there 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 was a um, you know um, the mosque uh, was attacked, and then me and there as were well, several um, incidents happening right after the New Zealand attack in uh, the UK. All around, there were almost five uh, mosques which were. Uh, targeted which were attacked glass was broken in them and reports claim that almost there was a 500 percent spike in islamophobic attacks against muslims what do you think is happening here because after the new zealand attack it was assumed that everybody accepted islamophobia as being a problem but instead there was a rise in islamophobic attacks Yes, uh, if you see the news as well here in UK, after the attack, um, there are like uh, five mosques in Birmingham that throw with the sledgehammers, and then um, you know, and then the whole the whole city in the UK they uh, start to put the um, higher security standard uh, on the mosques, and then uh, here where I'm living in Hull, for example, the Humberside police they. Uh, they try to support us to protect them and then stand with us because um, we don't know what will happen and then it will the potential will happen anytime because in normal situation we still have uh, this kind of potential racism and then the hatred and then it will become higher after the incident and tell us about the sentiments of the community after an attack or during uh, uh, an attack uh, what are their fears like what are their uh, what are their sentiments on ground the sentiment is uh, of course when when the news uh, let's say um, come up with the the Muslim that to be blamed because uh, for example um, the attack uh, in Sri Lanka uh, you know in the news, uh, they realized that it's uh, because of Muslim did it. 
And then after that, they uh, start um, blame Muslim. And then whatever the reason, they just look at Muslim as uh, uh, the part that to be blamed on this. And then, of course, it, it, it is not fair. And then um, what I'm afraid is like uh, it's just about children and then women and then uh, who don't know about this and then they will have the impact on this and then um, racism in UK uh, normally it's like uh, you know especially in uh, whole where I'm living it's like one of the uh, most racist uh, city if I'm not mistaken because uh, every single day uh, when I'm for example when I uh, walk on the market and then they try uh, they start being racist and then but um, a part of that, not that many uh, people doing like that. And yeah. then I believe that wise people, they understand this and then uh, they can, they will not blame all, the entire community as the part that to be blamed. Yeah, and Mr. Mamoud, we're hearing all these experiences. How do you think fundamental basic human rights are being compromised when uh, we're even talking about Western democracies when this is happening? Attacks and also uh, narratives being constructed by politicians against minorities. Yeah, well, politicians do. Uh, the trouble with democracy is that there are uh, politicians that will appeal to uh, dog whistle to racism to try and win votes, and that's just failure of democracy. I'm afraid that's what happens in, in sort of majority of democracy. You only have to look across in Asia, in many countries, where politicians dog whistle to racism and things like that, try to dogmatize, try and say, look, it's it's this, this, this is your problem. It's the Muslims, it's the East Europeans, it's these people or that people. That that's why it's failure, and sometimes government themselves have failed in their in their in their goals, and then will pick on a particular case and say, look, it's immigration, it's Islam, it's yeah. this, it's that. And I think that's why my earlier comment that politicians also need to be held responsible for these attacks and held accountable. Yeah, and what do you think uh, is the political climate attributing to these attacks, or is are these? Uh, attacks happening before and fueling into the political climate because after uh, the Brexit vote in 2016, an organization reported that there was a surge in anti-Muslim hate crimes. What do you think happened there? And do you think that with Brexit looming forward, there is that sentiment still fostering amongst the general public? Well, what happened is you have an instance and, and, and then what you have what you call copycat incidents. That means that someone sees it and then they start to copycat and, and it sort of spreads like wildfire. Uh, and sometimes the media can play a role in that. We have, we have what we call tabloid newspapers. They're, they're very cheap end of the newspapers. Uh, and they, they appeal to just sort of number of masses. They, they, they pull salary and they will often have uh, you know, very crazy headline that are totally misleading that we blame an incident on a particular race or whatever. Uh, give you, and this is not something that started now, this is something from 1930. There's a very big newspaper called the Daily. In 1930s, when we had Jewish people suffering prosecution coming to the United Kingdom, its headline was Hooray to the Black Shirts. Black Shirts were racist organizers, and that was actually attacking Jewish people. And I think we've always had that. We've always had uh, people trying to make money or trying to get publicity or trying to sort of, uh, you know, raise, raise sort of failure by covering one particular race, one particular religion or one particular ethnicity. Yeah, and that's that's always going to happen, and we who have to stand up to it and you know fight that at every level. And with that, Doctor Hijra Saputra, how difficult do you think countering that hate has become? With of course social media platforms being bombarded with hate speech, how do you think it? Uh, how exhausting has it become for people to continuously defend themselves and try to counter this hate speech and this hate narrative? Well, the social media is like um, the biggest challenge for, for Muslims because people around the world, everywhere, they, 
um, you know, it's like a verbal hatred as well. They can express their on social media. And then I believe uh, Facebook should, uh, you know, uh, have a positive rule on this and then like doing filtering and then, uh, you know, uh, let's say ban a certain account that um, stimulating the hatred and racism because uh, I believe that Facebook uh, have uh, a control for this and then for muslim of course um, the impact of that the uh, the expression of hatred and then you know will stimulate the others or uh, that have the same hatred and then you know because they can express the after on the social media in in the real life and then they it will go uh, through with this and then um, again um, the Muslim and then uh, the people that uh, become a victim on, on this hatred and racism will be uh, suffered on this. And uh, Dr. Hijra, how do you think the way forward is? What do you think needs to be done? Uh, and what role do you think uh, community leaders need to play towards interfaith harmony? Okay. Um, on the other hand, when the uh, let's say the racism, hatred, and then uh, come to Muslim, Muslim, um, uh, the leader on the local community should have a um, positive rule, uh, not to uh, propagate uh, uh, the people who are uh, victimized on this, and then they should bring a positive spirit, not to react negatively, and then um, they have to, you know. Uh, it's very important role for the uh, local leader to make the situation become positive and then uh, we have to react uh, wisely and then do not uh, being propagated with a, a sort of uh, yeah. hatred and racism. Yeah. So at that point in time, it's the purpose of community leaders to settle the situation down and make sure that the a situation is not aggravated. Uh, that's what I'm uh, taking from your point there, Dr. Hijra Saputra. Thank you so much for joining us and talking to us. Thank you, Mr. Mahmood Fez, for joining us and talking to us. Thank you for watching In This Special. We will see you again next week with more stories. Till then, goodbye and take care.